Chair Frank? Uh, here. Vice Chair Rose? Representative Glick? Representative Shaheen? Here. Representative Ramos? Here. Uh, Representative Noble? Here. Representative Campos? Here. Representative Hull? Representative Manuel? Here. Go ahead and call Representative Glick? Here. A quorum is present. All right, thank you, members. Uh, the chair lays out House Bill uh, 336 and recognizes Representative Toth to explain his bill. Thank you, Chairman. Members, HB 336 is about fairness, transparency, and protecting one of the most vulnerable subsets of our population, which is foster children. Many foster children throughout our state are eligible to receive benefits or services for which the appointment of a rep representative payee is necessary. And for most of these child beneficiaries, the Social Security Administration appoints the child parent or guardian to serve as the representative payee. However, for foster children, it is often neither possible nor appropriate. In these cases, the Social Security Administration is required to identify and select the representative payee who will best serve the child's interests, relying on federal preference lists for guidance. Um, HB 336 seeks to right these wrongs. If this bill were to become law, the Department of Family and Protective Services would be required to notify the foster child's attorney ad litem in situations in which the department desires to become the child's representative payee. This notification requirement will help prevent familiar situations in which the department applies to become the child's representative payee without adherence to federal guidelines or engaging in proper consultation with the child or the child ad litem. Um, for any child receiving U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs and Social Security Administration, my bill requires annual accounting submitted to the child and the child's legal representative. Um, HB 336 further requires the department to conserve uh, a certain percentage of the child's foster child's federal funds um, based on the child's age beginning um, at the age of 14. In a moment, you're going to hear from a family law attorney, Maureen Ball, who is a subject expert, and she can speak to the specifics of her, of her experience in this law. And um, we've actually, this is a bill that I laid out before you guys last session that you um, uh, voted out favorably. And I'm sure that Maureen would be available to answer any questions that you all may have. Okay. The uh, chair recognizes Vice Chair Rose is present. Um, yeah, we, yeah, this ended up uh, a little lower bill number this year. Right. <laughs> it was, was kind of yeah, kind of got it very, very late last year to get it through the process, but it's an in interesting uh, issue. Can you walk through a couple of the examples of what kind of money, where it's going, or would you I'd rather? I'd much rather have okay. Ms. Ball do that, and okay. I reserve the opportunity to close if I could. Yep, you, you will have that. Members, any other questions? Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, chair calls, uh, we'll call Maureen Ball, uh, self for the bill. Hello, chairman and committee members. I'm pleased to be with you again this session. My yes. name is Maureen Ball and I'm speaking on behalf of House Bill 336. Okay. Um, and just, just to be clear, uh, you're representing yourself and you are for the bill. Yes, you said sir. you were speaking on behalf, so. Yes, Chairman. Okay, very good. Yes, and I prepared a package to give to you, I think that's already been handed out. Um, last session, I stumbled into this representing a child, and I brought that issue to you. Um, through that process, I have learned about the national issue that's involved here that's being addressed by many, many organizations. Um, it's being addressed at the federal level as well as through various states. Um, in Alaska, there is pending litigation, and there was an amicus brief filed by one of these organizations in support of this type of um, issue. I provided that to you because it really does give you a good idea about the legal issues involved and the constitutional issues that need to be addressed. Unfortunately, our foster children in Texas' constitutional rights are not being protected um, in various ways. First off, with the notification process. 
The child's attorney is not notified when the department automatically seeks to be the representative payee. That is a problem, as uh, Representative Toth mentioned. There are perhaps better people suited to be the representative payee. In fact, the Social Security Administration has a list of people. The agency is at the bottom of it. But they start first because they automatically do this. They automatically do it without notice. That's the constitutional issue. Due process requires these children's benefits be protected. The person assigned to the case, the attorney, is in a position to make sure that their federal benefits are protected. The attorney is never notified that the department is automatically pursuing this. That's a detriment to the child because there are administrative guidelines in place to appeal any decision made. But the attorney's not even given notice that this process is in place. So we're behind the eight ball. We can't adequately, adequately represent the child unless we know that the department is applying to be the representative payee. Then you get into the question of how these funds are utilized for the children. These funds are the children's federal benefits. There's other monies used to, um, for the children in care. The benefits through the Social Security Administration, those are the child's benefits. And the accounting is supposed to be provided by the department on an annual basis to the Social Security Administration on how those funds are used. The attorney does not even get that annual accounting, none. And so as far as that fiscal note goes, you know, notice to the attorney that they're applying to be the beneficiary or applying to be the representative payee is a simple email. There's no cost involved in that. The department should be in touch with the child's attorney on everything being done related to the child. An email costs nothing. Then the accounting procedure they're required to do every year, that's already in place. They're mandated to do that by federal legislation. You can use that information to provide it in a breakdown for the child's attorney periodically through the case. I, I'm astonished that their fiscal bill comes out with these outrageous numbers. The reason it's important that the attorney knows how that money's being utilized, there's oftentimes unmet needs of the child that needs to be addressed. As a personal example, this session, I'm representing a child, if I could continue just for a second. Yeah, and I think there'll be some questions, so okay. if you... Um, you know, this session, I'm representing a child who came into care, an orphan. It's a very, very sad situation. She's nonverbal and autistic, 14 years old. Um, she needs supervision at night. At night, she wakes up and she wanders through the foster home. She's in a wonderful foster home. They're trying everything they can do to take care of her. We're in the process of trying to address her diagnosis and, and those type of things, but she needs supervision at night. Medicaid has refused to pay for it. They're saying that it's not covered, you know, from the 7 p.m. to when she wakes up in the morning. And that's a need the child has. You know, there's a way that those federal benefits could be utilized to provide for that care until we find out different ways that may help her, you know, adjust her medication and things like that. But that needs to be for the child. Okay. Um, members, any questions? So in, in the case that you're talking about, does that child currently have some benefits coming to them that's going straight to the department? Yes. Is that the... Uh, well, um, I say I keep calling you your honor. I'm so used to being in court. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, there's nothing honorable up here. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> right. Um. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. in, in this situation, um, she's actually got uh, no veterans for you. benefits. Her father was a veteran. And so she's got um, benefits coming in because her father died. And so she's got some benefits that will be coming to her. Um, the department has um, applied to be her representative payee. In that case, I'm not objecting to it because of the situation the child is in. However, the next step is how those funds are utilized. All right. So are you, uh, what kind of representation are you with the child? Are you the attorney ad litem or what? Okay, you're, just an, you're an attorney ad litem? Yes, yes. I've been appointed um, to represent parents and children. I think it's very important that parents, parents' constitutional rights are protected, but I also yeah. represent children. And so when I represent children, there's different issues involved. And um, I come to, to you today as a representative of the child. Okay. Yeah, if we could, if we could have attorney ad litems like that around the state, it would be easy. Honestly, the system would work. Mm -hmm. I mean, seriously, we just have some attorneys that aren't even showing up. So it's like it, it's... Um, so thank you for bringing this. Members, any other questions? Uh, thank you. Yeah, Representative Noble. And I apologize if you already explained this and I just didn't get it. So, so these benefits that are, that are benefits that 
the child has by, you know, by inheritance. Um, are they going into a child's bucket or are they going into the state's bucket? Oh, I roll my eyes on that one. Okay, when you look at the CPS handbook policy, um, there's different buckets that the child's money goes into. Uh -huh. Right now, basically that money's being used to pro pro provide for the child's care. That's sure. That's basically the policy. However, there's also federal regulation that says, no, you've got money in a different bucket to pay for the child. My, my assertion to you is that that money that the child's getting for federal benefits is separate and apart and should be utilized separately. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Members, any other questions? All right, thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to call the resource witness up, uh, uh, Erica bon Bonwellis from DFPS uh, on the bill. If you'd state your name, who you're with, and your position on the bill. Erica Bagnolos, I'm the CPS Associate Commissioner, and I'm here as a resource witness. Okay, thank you. Um, so one of the comments was, that was made was constitutional rights and the uh, notification. It seems like there's some things. I'm wondering whether the agency's current procedures and practices line up with law, right? There's, I mean, there's two sides to this. One, are we following law? The other is a policy question of where the money should go, because, I mean, you Honestly, you make an argument either way. If the state's paying for all their, their expenses, getting reimbursed for money that's going to the kid is a reasonable thing. At the same time, there is the following the law. So do you, are you aware whether or not our current policies and procedures are consistently following the laws in terms of notification to lawyers and the way we're handling this? To my knowledge of the information that I have, we are. Uh, we do um, communicate regularly with the attorney. Any assigned attorney to our, our children, they have access to whatever records they deemed are necessary. So if there is a question about um, how their client is, um, how the money is being used or how, you know, how much is their client receiving, they, they um, have the authority to request just about any records from us at any given time they could request those for, from us. And we do have constant communication with the ad items. We have staffings with them, and they can request that. And for, but from, from a process standpoint, does the, ag the agency always request that the money comes to them? Is that so DFPS, a standard uh, procedure? So DFPS does request to be the payee. However, if the child is placed with kinship, um, then that money is directed um, over to the kinship provider. So if they're placed with a grandparent, the grandparent would be getting the benefits. So they would get the Since benefit they and they would get the 50% payment for kinship? Uh, yes. Yes. Okay. But, if in, but in a normal foster home, it would go to the if agency and then not the foster home? Correct. So if um, if the child is, is not in a kinship placement, then DFPS becomes the payee, and we pay. Um, it, it, it is an offset to the foster care pay. However, if they have multiple, some of our children qualify for multiple um, payments, so they do create a savings account for them. Um, and uh, we used one main source to pay off the, the or to offset the foster care rate, and so the other is placed in a... Um, in a, um, an account for them that is held for, for their use. So then I'm confused then, thank you very much. So, uh, but I'm confused then, so what is, what changes under this bill if we're following the law? What, what, is, what is the change, um, so, what is the fiscal note, what is the? So in reviewing the bill, um, what they're asking is that we provide notification to the um, to the ad litem from the initiation of us requesting <clears throat> that the FPS become the payee. Um, and it's also requesting that at every per, uh, placement hearing, which takes place every six months, that we create a report, um, a financial report, giving the information over to the ad litem. So right now, that's not a report that we create. So we would need to create um, a, a very specific process for it because we don't have it in place right now. So um, I understand, you know, based on the number of placements that we are currently or the number of um, eligibility that we're currently tracking, we would need more FTEs to help with that process because it's not something that we currently do. 
All right, y'all. Different. All right. She said more LTEs. I was like, my goodness. Yeah. Well, and I do. Well, and I, I think this goes back a little bit to the appropriations process. It's a little bit frustrating because to me, we have such a big decrease in the number of kids. We should be able to reallocate some of those to right. better staff instead of, you know what I mean, where we where we don't change the staffing and yet something like this that could be done with one or two people. It's like, but um, I realize that's a bigger picture than just you. I'm just ruminating. Or, yeah, uh, Representative or Chair Click. Sorry. The question I have is on kids that are in managing or, or permanent managing conservatorship. Do they have an ad litem continuously? Yes, they do have an ad litem. Okay, because I, I wasn't sure that they would continue yes. to have an ad litem. They do. You know, okay. Yes. All righty. Thank you. Chair recognizes Representative Hall is present. Going back and forth between insurance, by the way, if you think she's not paying attention, she is. She's just in two committees at once. So, uh, members, any other questions of the resource? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, chair calls Julia Hatcher, uh, South and TAFDA, for the bill. If you'd state your name, who you're with, and your position on the bill, please. Hi, I'm Julia Hatcher. I'm an attorney in Galveston. I'm also the president of the Texas Association of Family Defense Attorneys, which is TAFTA. I put TAFTA because it's easier to type. <laughs> um, I'm for the bill. Um, and I'll just tell you a story. Um, I uh, also represent parents and children, and I had a, a teenager that I represented. Um, she wanted to emancipate. And um, but she had no way to support herself. She didn't have a job. She hadn't even finished school, but she wanted to emancipate because she was tired of the department. Anyway, um, she was getting benefits from her deceased mother. And um, I tried to get that information from them. And the best that I could get was in an order, we agreed that they would attempt to get me an accounting. And it never happened. So she turned 18, decided she didn't want a lawyer anymore, and... We went our merry ways, although I think she's still in care, but I haven't kept contact with her. But anyway, that's just one example of it is not true that we can ask for the records and get them because I asked for them and did not get them. I didn't even know what her monthly benefit was. Um, you know, she was a teenager. She wanted her nails done. She wanted her hair done. I mean, these weren't medical necessities, but there are things that, you know, a teenager wants, a teenage girl wants, and um, a phone. <laughs> And uh, anyway, um, I also represent a two-year-old uh, whose mother's been terminated and her father's deceased. And so she's getting a benefit. I have no idea what that benefit is. None. None at all. So um, I just want you all to know that when somebody from DFPS comes up here and says that we can get whatever records we want, that's not true. It may be written in the policy that we should get the records but we're not getting the records. And in fact, we're not even told when things are happening with our kids most of the time. Yeah. We're the last ones to find out. So okay. if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Yes, Representative Ramos. Um, I understand and when she said you can ask, I mean, her statement was clear, you can ask for whatever. <laughs> right, right. You know, but right. not that you'll receive yeah. it, but of course you can ask for anything. You can ask for the moon and that doesn't mean you'll get it. My question to you is, if in fact you were to receive a report of those funding, that the, the money that was there what was being allocated or what have you, what do you anticipate the role of the ad litem would be or how that would, like for example, allow you to get the child the cell phone that the child needs or wants or what have you? So what, what, what does that look like? Well, I mean, I would ask them first, and if they didn't agree to it, then I could file a motion and ask the court to order it. Um, but the bigger picture in, in her specific case was that I could have filed a petition for her to emancipate if I knew how much money she was getting and whether or not she could support herself. Um, but, you know, I can't do that. I can't file a frivolous lawsuit just because she wants to emancipate if I can't prove. You know what I'm saying? Um, yeah. So that that's, puts us in a, a bind. Any members, any other questions? Thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, Chair calls uh, Tiffany Crouch, uh, Texas Lawyers for Children, for the bill. And I show nobody else wishing to testify. And actually, is Ms. Crouch here? Did we lose her at lunch? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Tiffany Crouch Bartlett. 
Still not here. Okay, we will show her for the bill, but not testifying. Okay, at this time, there are no other witnesses signed up to testify. Is there anyone else wishing to testify on for or against HB 336? Okay, you signed up, showing not to testify, but you wish to testify, so we will switch that. So come on up. That would be okay. <laughs> but Jeff, clever and pithy too. We are, we we like all those. If you state your Jeff name, who you're with, disability and you're... rights Texas, and we are for the bill. And I just wanted to say, uh, disability rights Texas is the state's protection and advocacy organization for Texans with disabilities. And we have a team of attorneys that represent children in foster care with significant disabilities. And we see this bill really about transparency, so our attorneys can do their jobs. One of the biggest responsibilities that our attorneys have with the, the children that they represent is what's going to happen after they leave care. What's going to be next? And in order to do that, in order to plan for transition, our attorneys need to know what kind of benefits they're getting. Are they getting SSI or SSDI or a VA uh, payment of some sort? How much is that? Who is the representative payee? What's being done with that money? Because all of those programs that these children are going to need after they leave the care of the state are all very complicated and very contingent on assets and income and all of those kinds of things. And so if our attorneys don't know what they have, they don't necessarily know what questions to ask about those assets or who to ask them from, and we've already heard that even when asked, they don't always get those things. We see this bill as a way to allow them to start making that planning more um, strategic and more beneficial to the people that we represent. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you, members. Any questions? All right, thank you for your testimony. Uh, at this time, there are now no other witnesses signed up to testify. Is there anyone else wishing to testify on, for, or against HB 336? Going, going, gone. Seeing none, public testimony is closed, and the chair recognizes Representative Toth to close on HB 336. No doubt you've noticed the fiscal note on this bill was originally $16.5 million last biennium. Given that reality, and it's only $1.8 million by the time you get this over to the Senate, it'll practically be free. That's right. <laughs> Well, and, so, I, and if I could, before you, or I don't, just before you close, I just want to make a comment because, and really, this is to the agency. Um, there has been a tremendous reduction in the number of kids, and we haven't necessarily moved those people to the work. The way I read the bill, there's nothing that would stop you from doing it now. Nothing. You don't have to wait for a rider. You don't have to wait for people. We just. We ought to be looking for ways to do our job better now that, honestly, there's, I mean, certainly the staffing should be fine from a, I say fine, should be at more than adequate. We've literally gone from 30,000 kids to 20,000 kids. I realize they're the, by and large, the easier kids, if you will, but still, that's a tremendous drop. There are resources there. I'm not saying we don't pursue this bill, I'm not saying the bill doesn't continue to move, but I'm saying it really is not required to my reading for the agency to actually provide this information. It's something that would be a best practice if you're just running an agency and trying to make sure you're meeting kids' needs. This is something you would just be doing. Um, and so I was just going to throw that out because we can do bills all day, but if somebody, you know, I, and I really do think the agency, I, I think the commissioner's kind of got some, got some very good ideas, is actually putting some processes in place. So I think there's, a, there's, a, there's some things happening. So with that, Yes. Continue. I mean, Sorry. This is just no. Thank you. That's this is just common sense. This is what when government does a program, this is what we should be doing. And so thank you for loving these kids. And I ask for a favorable consideration from this committee. I really appreciate y'all's time. Thank you very much. Uh, any other questions? Uh, you close, I assume. I close. If there's no objection, House Bill 33 or 336 will be left pending. Is there objection? The chair hears none. HB 336 is left pending without objection. And yeah. if I can turn the pages correctly. Okay, the chair lays out House Bill 423 and recognizes Representative Lopez to explain his bill. Well, good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chairman and committee members. Thanks for allowing me to kind of 
slip around the process there and come up a little earlier. Uh, and thank Representative Noble for being so great. I, I'm grateful for that. I really do appreciate that. Uh, I want to take a, a minute of your time to explain House Bill uh, uh, 423, which is a uh, child care study bill that I'm bringing forward. This is my third time. Hopefully the third time's a charm. Uh, you know, around here, you never know. Uh, things can happen in the first swing of the bat and go over the, uh, the fence. I wasn't able to get it there. Uh, but uh, we tried again last year, and we're continuing to try to move this bill forward. Let me explain real quickly what the bill does. It instructs Health and Human Services Commission and the Texas Work Workforce Commission to conduct a study regarding the cost of child care in comparison to wages. Uh, basically, it's, a, it's a, you know trying to build parity between wages and the cost to provide health care. Uh, can, I would imagine that we would all agree that uh, every family deserves affordable and quality health care or child care. Uh, my constituents and uh, my fellow Texans have noted that uh, rising uh, child care costs have made it difficult for working families to have ac access to not only adequate but affordable uh, child care. Uh, this study will quantify that gap. Uh, in fact, it's recommended that uh, parents spend no more than 7% of their total income on child care. And in 2018, uh, reported by the Children at Risk, uh, found that families are spending about 30%, which is definitely has gotten uh, out of kilter significantly, uh, which causes uh, a lot of downstream uh, uh, consternation for the families and society in general. As a result, an, an inability for, uh, to afford child care has resulted in parents leaving the workforce early or, or relying on unlicensed or unqualified child care providers, which is never in the best interest of that child. And I believe this bill will, will begin to address uh, uh, those gaps. Uh, these con con constituents also suggested legislation uh, action to further understand the issue, prompting uh, me to bring this study forward. Uh, the bill addresses uh, the lack of child care cost data, uh, which disproportionately affects lower income families. To be clear, uh, there is, there was a bit of a struggle, and I know some of us, uh, and it's been commented at this podium this morning, uh, are getting fiscal notes, and one, they're coming in a little bit late, and you kind of take a step back and go, oh my God, that's a, that's a big number. Uh, the fiscal note on this one is about 1.5 million, which is a step back considering that it was nothing before. Uh, and I think part of the problem is we did our very, very preliminary indication is we are working through two different agencies, Texas Workforce Commission, and HSST. One of them has the data, but the other one was charged with collecting that data. So I believe that the $1.5 million is to start from scratch and begin to collect all that data. That certainly won't be necessary. What we've asked them to do is to collaborate, share the data, and I believe being able to re reduce that fiscal note, hopefully to nothing, uh, but certainly to a significant num number less than $1.5 million. Uh, you know, there are significant differences in I mean, uh, there are differences in the bill, not necessarily very significant. Uh, for example, moving the deadline from one uh, date to another, extending it a little bit. Again, uh, there are changes in the bill, uh, but they're not that, that significant. Uh, it also asks for wages, uh, uh, for uh, uh, family income to be considered uh, rather than wages. Uh, you know, not a big significant difference but would make a difference in being able to calculate an effective number for these folks. So uh, that basically lays out the bill. I'll be glad to answer any questions you may have, but I do know that there are some witnesses that will be able to testify specifically to some of these, these facts and uh, determine if there's no questions, I reserve the right to close. Okay. You will certainly have it. Uh, members, any questions of the representative? Okay. Thank you very Thank you. much. Uh, and we do have resource witnesses, although that's always the case. We have resource witnesses. So. Let's see who we have. Chair calls Cody Somerville, and then uh, Carrie Goins is on deck. And those are the – oh, I'm sorry. There is another one as well. If you'd state your name, who you're with, and your position on the bill, please. Hello, Chairman Frank and members of the committee. My name is Cody Somerville. I'm the Executive Director of the Texas Association for the Education of Young Children. And I'm testifying for HB 423. The Texas Association for the Education of Young Children is the largest membership association for early childhood professionals in the state of Texas with about 3,000 members and 20 chapters across the state. Working families have far less access to childcare today than before the pandemic. 
As of January 2023, Texas had 27% less child care programs operating than compared to March 2020. And unfortunately, only one out of 10 early child educators earns a living wage in the state of Texas, which contributes to high turnover rates and unstable staffing in child care programs. Without adequate staff, child care programs cannot maximize enrollment, making it all the more difficult for them to balance their budgets. The average wage of a child care teacher in Texas is $12 an hour with no benefits. Low wages is driving staffing shortages in our industry, which leads to a decline in child care availability. While educator compensation is low, tuition remains unaffordable for most working families. In 2022, the average cost for infant care uh, in Texas was just over $10,000 a year. And how can that be? Um, that's quite a bit of money for um, a working family. The majority of child care programs budgets goes towards labor cost. Young children require low teacher to child ratios to protect their health and safety. Um, and child care programs are also usually open 11 hours a day. So low ratios plus long business hours um, equates to high labor cost. Many child care programs in Texas were able to utilize child care relief funds from the Texas Workforce Commission throughout the pandemic uh, to increase compensation of educators and limit tuition increases to families. However, these funds are running out. In a recent survey that we conducted of about 1,600 child care uh, programs revealed that 44% of programs are likely or maybe likely to close in the next year. That's on top of 27% less programs in the state. This bill directs the uh, state agencies to study the link between wages and the cost of child care. And we believe that this is a critical issue to the well-being of the Texas economy and all working families. Families cannot afford to pay any more in child care, and early childhood educators cannot afford to earn any less. This study um, will provide the state legislature with data that can be used to guide state investment. Texas currently only invests what is required under the Child Care and Development Block Grant by the federal government and not a dollar more. This is putting working families, uh, child care programs, and early childhood educators um, in a tough position and relying on them to fill the gap. We urge this committee to vote in favor of HB 423 and to use the results of the study to develop investment strategies that support early childhood educators and working families. Thank you. Thank you. Members, any questions? All right, very good. Thank you. Uh, chair calls Carrie Goins, and then Robin Wells is on deck. And if you'd state your name, who you're with, and your position on the bill. Hi, my name is Carrie Goins, and I'm testifying for HB 423. I'm the executive director of Child Care Partners, a nonprofit. And are you representing just yourself or? Child Care Partners. Child Care Partners and Sorry. for the bill. Okay. Child Care Partners is a nonprofit agency that has provided high quality child care for low income working families in Wichita Falls for over 100 years. We currently operate four early learning centers in our community. The compensation of early childhood educators is a challenge for programs like ours. We currently serve 177 children, all of which receive scholarships either through Texas Workforce Commission's Child Care Subsidy Program or through our own fundraising efforts. We have to fundraise over half of our income to make our budget work, and 75% of our agency's expenditures are all staff wages. To provide high-quality care for children in our community, we need 60 staff across our four centers. Our centers are open 11 hours a day, so we need staff for multiple shifts. At an average of $13 per hour per staff, our labor costs with benefits are just under $2.2 million annually. When you divide this number by the number of children we are able to serve, this equates to about $7,800 per child. This number does not factor in costs such as food and materials, etc. Over the last two years, I've increased wages by $2 an hour, 20%. I still cannot find employees. We are licensed to care for 280 children, but I'm only able to provide care to 177 due to staffing shortages. We provide retirement, direct primary care, health care benefits, and tuition assistance, but this is not enough to make up for the low wages we are able to offer. Families in our community are struggling to find child care. Each week, we take upwards of four calls from desperate parents. Last week, a mother of a six-week-old, a seven-year-old, and an eight-year-old walked in to beg for a spot for her child. Her only other option was to have her other young children take turns skipping school to care for their infant sister. 
In Wichita County last year, 72% of child abuse cases were neglectful supervision. Every child in our center is a child we know is receiving the care and attention they deserve and that their parents are able to pursue gainful employment. Child care is more than babysitting. It's education that follows children to high school and through their adult lives. It supports industries and allows higher workforce participation, especially among, among single mothers. It prevents child abuse by placing children in the care of trained teachers who see them daily. Much change is needed to ensure the industry is sustainable and that early childhood educators are fairly compensated while keeping childcare costs affordable for working families. This bill is a step in the right direction. With little state investment in childcare currently, a study like this can help guide the state in understanding the level of investment necessary to ensure the cost of childcare and the wages of early childhood educators work for early childhood educators and for families. Unfortunately, most early educators are not seen as teachers. For the last five years, I've told my staff, I see you, your teachers too, and I will do my best to tell your story to anyone who would listen. So thank you for listening to me today. Thank you very much. Um, Y'all do, do a great job. You notice she said Wichita Falls, right? So <laughs> been, been to your place. Thank you. Uh, any questions, members? All right, no. All right, thank you very much. Chair calls Robin Wells, self, uh, for the bill. I show nobody else wishing to testify, so if you want to testify, please get registered. If you'd state your name, who you're with, your position on the bill, please. Yes, I'm, I'm Robin Wells, and I'm representing myself. I own two preschools, and I'm for this bill, and um, I live in Lucas, Texas. Representative Noble. Um, we like Lucas, too. <laughs> Um, my businesses are in a different district. I'm going to tell you a little bit about it. Um, I'm an owner and operator of two Goddard preschools in McKinney, Collin County. I'm also a PhD student at Texas Women's University studying child development and early education. Got about another year. Um, I'm here today to support HB 423 by Representative Lopez um, that directs HHSC and TWC to do an analysis of the wages of child care teachers compared to the cost of tuition. But a little bit of background on my school. I'm on the opposite end of the spectrum um, than, than Carrie's um, schools are. Um, my schools, how they, they're in a high socioeconomic demographic in McKinney. McKinney has a population of approximately 214,000 with a median age of 36.5 and an average household income of 113,000 with a poverty rate of 9%. And we have a lot of families making money and babies where my schools are. Um, our two schools are accredited with... Making money and babies. Yeah. Our two schools are accredited with the National Association for the Education of Young Children, and we also have, of my two preschools, four-star rating from the Texas Workforce Commission. Between our two schools, we serve 200 families, 350 children between the ages of six weeks and 10 years, and we only have two families on subsidy. Um, uh, we're fully enrolled at both schools. Um, our incentive to accommodate a subsidy family is community service, and um, I would accommodate more if I had room for them. Um, we lose an average of $450 a month on each subsidy child we enroll. Um, as a point of reference, our infant room is $340 a week. I think Carrie's is... $56 scholarship. Yeah, it's about $56 dollars a week is what they pay and my preschool is 295 so we do everything we can to pro provide high quality early education to families um, since 2021 we've raised teacher wages 25 percent to stay competitive and we actually to fight inflation we've only raised parents tuition by about six percent and I put the numbers in my written testimony and that was made possible by the child care relief fund through the TWC so our challenge is this our schools are full and our tuition is already high and our payroll costs are 50 percent of gross revenue carries I think she just said was 75 percent which is a lot of schools that are in child care deserts taking care of the underserved um, the safe zone for payroll costs in business is somewhere between 15 and 30 percent, and that includes payroll and payroll taxes. So I don't know why this industry, um, we're people heavy, but we just seem to operate out of the safe zone of what a business needs to be, just even, even a nonprofit profitable when it comes to payroll. And I don't know why, which is why um, we support 
any action that puts two agencies together to try to come up with a solution for us because we obviously don't have it. Um, corporate child care franchise groups like the Goddard schools that I'm a part of, um, they use data and analytics to find locations that have characteristics to be successful. Um, my type of model only builds in locations that have rooftops and people making money and making babies. Um, we feel extremely fortunate that we can deliver high quality of care and we pay our teachers an average of $17 an hour. But I know across the state that families cannot afford to pay more and our teachers cannot afford to earn less. So in closing, I would just like to encourage you to support HB 423 so that we can have access to data that could help the state of Texas and the Texas Workforce Commission just to, to consider ways to increase and um, invest in the foundational funding for the early child care industry. I'm, I'm here to advocate for schools in a whole lot worse shape than I am, but I thought my voice would just be helpful. No, that, it was very helpful to see the different types. So, uh, members, any questions? Appreciate you taking time to be here. Uh, I show nobody else. At this time, there's no other witnesses uh, signed up to testify. Is there anyone else wishing to testify on for or against House Bill 423? Seeing none, public testimony is now closed, and the chair recognizes Representative Lope as to close on HB 423. Well, uh, thank you, Chairman. I think you heard uh, some uh, pretty. Uh, in, we're going uh, to stand. We're going to stand at ease for just a minute. I'm not sure, sure why. So absolutely. Chill. We're good. We're good. Sorry, we were just trying to we're trying to make sure we don't do points of orders on anything. Not that anybody's going to call a point of order on this, but we're just. Uh, we were checking on uh, a verbal comment that came out, making sure it wasn't in the record. Anyway, continue. So we're good? We're good. Well, being good, uh, I want to thank you for taking the time to listen to it and for, uh, and more importantly, to listen to the testimony. I think it underscored that uh, this is not uh, really uh, signifying any particular area. It's uh, rural, it's urban, it's suburban, it's rich, it's poor, it's across the board. Uh, a lot has to happen for there to be uh, a, a methodology for us to be able to provide good child care. There's a lot of other issues that are that are associated with it, that, are, that are downstream uh, uh, being affected by not being able to get good child care, uh, whether it includes like what some of the testimony had was many children that, uh, that are in high school age are staying home to take care of their kids because that's the best that their parents can do so that they can go out and get a job. I can tell you that as a school board member back in the 90s when we were focusing very uh, specifically on, on truancy, thinking that it was a scourge of the world because we couldn't get these kids to be interested enough to come to school. We're finding that there were reasons they were coming. It's not because they were malicious children or wanting to not uh, participate in the education process, but, but they had other responsibilities that unfortunately were put on them uh, as children uh, that, uh, uh, that needed to be doing something else. So uh, I think this bill uh, is, is ready to move forward uh, uh, successfully, I hope. I would ask for your consideration and I with those comments, I will make myself available to any questions, but I would. Yeah. Members, any questions? And I close. You close. All right, very good. Chairman, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, if there's no objection, House Bill 423 will be left pending. Is there objection? Chair, here's none. House Bill 423 is left pending without objection. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the chair lays out House Bill 793 and recognizes Representative Noble to explain her bill. And I know you've got, you've been working on a committee sub, but we don't have it before us, so you're welcome to tell us the changes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, Vice Chairman and members for the opportunity to lay out House Bill 793. Uh, and I do have a committee sub that I'm working on and, and I'll explain a little bit of what that will be different. Uh, parents and families in, in our child protective services system are often required by DFPS to complete services before they are reunited with their children. Currently, those services are, are only available to parents through state contracted providers. These providers available options because of geography or work schedules are often difficult to schedule and are not easily accessible for some families. Many of our parents want to do the right thing but are not given the resources or opportunities to do so effectively. Many single parents work multiple jobs to support their families. The difficulty in scheduling and delays in the process keeps them from finishing the reunification process. House Bill 793 would allow parents the option to choose a qualified 
or licensed provider that best fits their needs. These providers, just like state contracted providers, would be required to meet a set of criteria and they would be reimbursed by the state for the average cost of the services provided. Each family has a unique set of needs and this bill allows parents to choose a provider best suited to meet their needs and would allow them to become reunited with their children as quickly as possible, which of course is our goal as a committee. In order to do the right thing, our parents should not have to sacrifice their job, find public transportation options, or wait longer than necessary to complete CPS required training or intervention. My bill gives Texas parents opportunities, it gives them buy-in, and it gives them flexibility so we can speed up family reunification. In the committee sub, I will change uh, two things, uh, so be watching for that. First, in our efforts to assure, ensure that families choose qualified providers, we went too far in the, in the language uh, by requiring stricter standards than are currently applicable in state contracted providers. So we will be striking um, B and um, it, so that that, so that the providers just have to meet the current standards. B1. And then also the committee saw, so we'll also remove the requirement that the department convene a work group to assist in developing rules. It turns out we've discovered that the agency already has the ability and procedure in place to implement this whenever a judge orders it done. So they already are doing this on, on a case by case basis. We're just asking for, for that to, um, to happen. I'd like to address the fiscal note. And just to be clear, those are anticipated changes. Those are anticipated changes. The bill before you does not yet show that. Um, the fiscal note. Lordy. Uh, honestly, the agency should be a little embarrassed to have submitted this fiscal note. Um, the bill requires uh, that agency reimburse additional providers in the same manner and the same amount that they are currently doing. We're not inventing a wheel here. There will be no increase in number of children served or the increase in services. We're talking about the services that are already required and the kids that already need them. Um, so we are just talking about the same that for families to have options. And um, and honestly, for the for for to ask for three FTEs plus whatever zillion dollars it was just really gave me a heart attack. So. <laughs> all we are, um, all we are asking is that other qualified or licensed providers get added to the list, so that those that are already on the, that are already doing this work and are ready to do that work can be paid. This bill actually shouldn't cost a penny. Um, we're trying to make it easier for parents, and this fiscal note is just a huge outrageous roadblock for those parents. I think it's obvious that the agency really didn't understand their role in implementing this, and, and, I'm, and I'll, I'm happy to work with them to clear up that misunderstanding. So I'm happy to answer any questions you have on House Bill 793, and I reserve the right to close. All right, thanks. You will have it. Members, any questions? Yes, Representative Ramos. Thank you, uh, Chairman. Representative Noble, so what are some examples of the providers that you're um, – that your bill is trying to address some of the um, provider type of provide services at the type of providers. Yeah, well, I have some I have some witnesses that are here today that that can, that that live and work in this in this arena, and so they would be able better to answer that. But but currently, there's providers that are ready and willing. And honestly, as we as we switch to community care, which is what community-based care, we're asking for more people to have buy-in for have success for families to, to be able to support the families and work with them. We're just, we're just cutting out that, that they have to be a provider that has already contracted with the state. We, we want to have options available. So, so, um, something might be a psychological exam. Sometimes parents need that. And, and of course that would be somebody that would be licensed to, to do that, but maybe not contracting with the state c currently or a family service for, um, for how to, to parent well. There's already some programs out there that are, that just haven't done haven't jumped through the hoops to become contracted with our state. I, I hope I'm getting that right, and I'm I'm assuming that my witnesses today will straighten that out if I if I got any of that incorrect. And, and I'll ask your witnesses as well because the bill, as it reads, I guess it's concerning because the, the testimony that you used said qualified or licensed provider, which is 100%. I'm on board, but the bill says 
evidence-based program or practice. That's that's the that's actually the sentence that I'm striking in. Or a promising program or practice. Yes. So that part is that's is that, taken that out. particular sentence. The promising seen. program. You'll okay. you'll see that gone. In yes, ma'am. Thank you. Yeah. And of course, uh, to to finish addressing that. It has to achieve the stated goals that the CPS worker and the judge have worked out for that family. So it's not like they're going to go to Uncle Joe and, and have him, you know, be doing their program. They have to sign off on it, that, it, that it's a qualified program, that it meets their needs. Okay, because this is a promising program. Well, so. Yeah, that's why we struck if, that. And if I'm understanding your comment correctly, the providing use of an evidence-based program is a bar that the agency is not even using right now. That's correct. That doesn't mean we should, though. But no, no, no. I, I, I agree. But I mean, I'm. Yeah. Th that's. Um, yeah. Uh, yes, Representative Manuel. So, for instance, so like, let's just say, like, we're you reuniting a child and a, a family together. Since we know we have a shortage of mental health professionals, if if the family would need like a licensed therapist or someone that's already not contracted to the state. As long as they meet the same requirements, like they have the same education, it, basically they're going to give the same kind of therapy. It would allow them to be able to come in and fill that gap in if they're a part of a, a service or a, something of that. Yes, and additionally, you may have noticed that we mm -hmm. did add an, an electronic ability to right. do that. So you have a mom that's working a job all day long. Right. She doesn't have the flexibility to go and leave her children at night to go get this done. And so we're just really hoping that, that we, can, we can add some layers of ability to, to help parents be successful quicker. That's what I wanted to check. Thank you so much. Uh -huh. All right. Thank you. Members, any other questions? All right. Uh, I am going to call the resource witness, Erica bon Bonuelos. Sorry, I'm going to get that right. Uh, DFPS resource on the bill. State your name, who you're with, and your position on the bill. Erica Bagnolo is a CPS Associate Commissioner and resource witness. Okay. I just want to talk some about the, the fiscal note, uh, and, and you guys have to move fast on this stuff as well, but it does a lot of times tell us what you're thinking on implementation. And so while I get frustrated, at, uh, as everybody does, clearly the bill author does, um, you know, um, what is it that you see y'all will have to do and why is it going to cost a lot of money? So currently the way we play, we uh, pay our service providers that are contracted with us is it's really done through uh, our impact system. It's electronic, right? If we go with somebody who doesn't have a contract with us, that that payment has to be done manually. So somebody actually has to do a manual payment. Um, and currently, I know I heard uh, Representative Noble say that currently some judges court order us to do certain um, services that we don't currently contract with, but we have to do an actual manual payment to that service provider because they're not in our system. So that does take a lot more manpower to do since it's not something that's just automated. Okay. And because so none, so none of the fiscal note is for higher payment. Or, or additional payment. I, I guess the, the bill makes sure it's uh, the same as the average pay, so there shouldn't be any difference if the parent has to get the service or is ordered for the service. I presume we want them to get the service. Absolutely. So, so there's no adjustment for that, like we're going to get more services, right? No, it's so we would pay only them. only the payment. Right, we would pay them what we currently pay our providers, um, which is the Medicaid rate. Okay. We wouldn't pay above that. Okay. Members, any other questions? Yes, Representative. So, um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So in a situation where a family, a, a mom to be reunited, I mean, I like the idea of the ex accessibility part of it, um, but if I'm mom and uh, reunification is, is based upon me taking these mental health classes or what have you, and I say I have a provider because I work all day during, and this is the only person that can do it at mm -hmm. Saturday morning or Sunday morning or what have you. Is what does it look like if? How long do you all anticipate, or, or what does it look like in practice where you all have to ensure that that person or that service provider is going to be able to accept that payment or what have you? Does it? How does it look like in the whole reunification process with 
there, I mean, I, I can see how it could be delayed and delayed. Mom's like, well, service provide hasn't got her check yet, so she's not willing to provide. And then that does that muddy up the reunification process, or what does that look like? The reunification process is really based on the progress that the parent has demonstrated through attending their services, mm -hmm. the evaluation that the therapist or the psychologist gives to the court. That's really what ultimately impacts the reunification. Um, as far as how it would, it might there be a delay? So right now, if we want to set somebody up with therapy, we just click, we develop a 2054, we send off everything to the provider, they have it. Um, since they're not contracted with us, we're not able to do that. So a provider, um, typically when a judge orders us, they're providers that they already work with very closely, so they know that there is a manual process that has to go through, so they're definitely probably not going to get their payment as quick as somebody who is contracted with us, and that's just because it has to be done manually. And we don't know how long that would take. I mean, it just depends. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Any other questions? All right, thank you. The chair calls Andrew Brown, uh, Texas Public Policy Foundation, for the bill. And then Julia Hatcher's on deck. You'd state your name, who you're with, and your position on the bill. Good morning. I'm Andrew Brown with the Texas Public Policy Foundation, testifying in favor of House Bill 793. House Bill 793 is really designed to lower barriers to families obtaining needed services and increase their likelihood of success at achieving reunification by speeding up that process, making it easier to access those services and hopefully accessing services that are more convenient to their lives. And the primary way that 793 accomplishes this goal is by affirmatively stating that you as a parent have a right to obtain services that you need that are ordered by a court from a provider of your choosing who meets the qualifications specified within 793. Um, and the quality of these services is safeguarded by the fact that this is placed in the provision of code that deals with the service planning process. So DFPS and the courts are already involved. They have insight. They have transparency to this process. They could potentially even say, you know what, that, that provider doesn't rise to the level of quality that the code requires. And as I was preparing for this testimony, you know, I don't often bring personal stories up when I give testimony in a professional capacity, but I reflected on my own journey with trauma and mental health. Um, very briefly, my first child was born premature by emergency C-section. And the first several months of his life were very difficult for our family. Um, and it took its toll on me uh, mentally. I mean, obviously, that birth scenario where you're wondering, is my child going to survive? Are they going to be okay long term? All of that builds on you. And, you know, I began um, struggling and um, having nightmares. Um, at one point, because we were in the NICU, I couldn't really sleep without the sound of the heart monitors. I got so used to that noise and being able to have my brain monitoring him while I was sleeping that I was unable to sleep when we weren't in the NICU uh, for a lot of times. And I eventually got to the point where I realized I need professional counseling. And my professional counselor uh, was a PhD in clinical psychology. And he also shared my faith history. We had that in common. It was one of the reasons why I picked him, because I got the science, but I also got somebody who understood where I was coming from, from a faith journey. And that helped me heal. I looked him up in the department's database to see if, God forbid, somehow I got involved with DFPS and needed mental health counseling, if I'd be able to obtain his services. Neither he nor the um, office that he works at are contracted providers with DFPS. He lived, or his, oh, he lived, his office was around the corner from my home. I actually rode my bike to several appointments with him um, just when it was a nice day or when my wife was using the car. Now, if I were to be involved with the FPS because of my job, because of the money that I make, because of insurance, I'd be able to cover that out of pocket. I would still have to advocate for that being approved, and I'd have to make sure I had a good attorney to advocate for that. But House Bill 793 makes sure people who can't do that have that exact same opportunity, and I will close with that. Thank you all. All right. Thank you, members. Any questions? Yes, Representative Manuel. Uh, thank you for that story, and I just want to, because that 
builds up to what I was going to ask. So basically, this would allow, um, like for instance, if you're looking for uh, a mental health um, a therapist or a psychologist that is um, more like pro LGBTQ, and you have that in your family, that's going to also allow you to be able to not have a to have a judge or someone force you to go to someone who wouldn't understand, which could cause more trauma for the Absolutely. family members during that time, or if it's more of a Catholic base rather than uh, someone who's not, it would be able to give the child keeping the unification together. Absolutely, yes, it gives... So a transition process still within the same bounds of what a family's already used to. Correct, and okay. we found in the research that... When it has greater involvement in agency in developing their services. It's why we use collaborative service planning. They are statistically more likely to be successful. And so that agency should extend to, you know, this is my unique background, whether right. it's LGBT, whether it's a specific faith background. Okay. That influences the way we approach services and get help. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, members. Any other questions? Yes, Representative Ramos. In your research, what do you anticipate the impact to be or um, the delay, for example, in processing or providing? Like, how how do we ensure that that's still expedited and the family is still meeting the, the deadlines or mom is still meeting the deadlines, let's say, to take those classes or do what have you without it affecting the overall reunification? Right. Um, and there are some attorneys that are going to be testifying that have real-world client experience with that, but I can tell you is this is analogous to an emerging uh, practice area, which is pre-petition representation. And one of the benefits of pre-petition representation, it's where a parent who has contact with CPS but a legal case has not been filed yet, they're able to connect with a licensed attorney, they're connecting with social workers. There's actually an amazing pilot program going on in McLennan County right now that I had the opportunity to visit with last summer. Um, why that works is not just because you're getting that early legal access before the petition is filed, but you also have the flexibility to get pre, um, uh, proactive services, mm -hmm. and you're not bound by the artificial limitations of who the department has contracts with. And so that practice that's emerging, that's emerging and is having research around it showing that it is effective at keeping families out and expediting reunifications when children have to go into the system, those practices can inform the way that we set this up mm -hmm. in Texas to do it in the post-removal context. Awesome. Thank you. Well, I wonder about whether or not, I mean, if you have more flexibility on providers, whether you're actually going to get services sooner rather than later, where you're actually, you know what I mean? Because if, if there's only three people on contract and all three of them are busy and are two months out, if there is alternatives or quicker alternatives that you might be quicker, and I know you don't practice in that area. Right. You so studied the be, area, but. Yeah, that would be the goal. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Members, any other questions? Thank all you. Right. Chair calls uh, Julia Hatcher, uh, self, and TAFDA for the bill. If you'd state your name, who you're with, your position on the bill, and Judy Powell's on deck. Chairman, members of the committee, um, again, my name is Julia Hatcher. I'm an attorney in Galveston, also president of TAFTA, which is the Texas Association of Family Defense Attorneys. Uh, we love this bill. Thank you so much, uh, Representative Noble. Um, that would mean you're for the bill, right? Yes, we're for the bill. I'm sorry. Sorry, I'm just checking. I mean, you could, you could love it and kind of be neutral. So I'm just <laughs> you're for the bill. Um, it it, uh, uh, it it's it's a struggle for parents to complete their services uh, when they have a job and when they have you know uh, stuff going on, um, and and one thing that COVID taught us is that Zoom is has been really helpful for a lot of things, um, one of which is classes because most of the classes were on Zoom, like all the classes were on Zoom during COVID. Some still are, um, so I love that you added that to the bill. Um, the only services that, that I have individually noticed that DFPS is requiring parents to pay for is parenting classes, um, which I never really understood because they'll spend thousands and thousands of dollars on monthly drug testing for parents that don't have their kids but won't pay for parenting classes so they can get their kids back. Uh, but that's another issue. Um, I would like to point out uh, that 263 only applies to services in removal cases where kids have actually been removed from their parents. Um, 264, 201 addresses services in court-ordered services cases. And the statute 264, 2031 says that parents have to pay for the services if they choose their provider. 
So um, I don't know if that's maybe something you could include in this bill to fix that so that the uh, codes are consistent, statutes are consistent, um, because I could see where that would be confusing for practitioners uh, and judges, too, and parents. Um, but other than that, we love it. Um, and I'd, I'd be happy to ask, uh, answer any questions. I can tell you in Wichita County, we did a CLE up there a couple of months ago, and the judge was complaining that there were no services being offered because they couldn't find the providers. They just didn't have the providers. I don't know if it was because of a lack of pay. Um, probably seems to be what everything is. Uh, but, but there just aren't any services offered up there. And I know in rural areas, it's really difficult to find service providers. Well, and sometimes, I mean, sometimes it's lack of pay. Sometimes it's difficulty of working with, you know, whether it's, I don't care whether you're a foster parent, whether you're whatever. I mean, sometimes just contracting with the state right. is a pain. You know, people would do it for free or for less than whatever, but just don't make you jump through all the hoops. And right. That's something right. we're looking at in other capacities, not not in this bill, but I mean, yeah. Right. But but my point was, I think if, if parents can choose your own providers uh, and maybe even find providers through a church, um, it'd be a lot easier for them. Okay, members, any other questions? All right. Thank you very much. Chair calls Judy Powell, Parent Guidance Center for the bill, and Brandon Logan is up next. If you'd state your name, who you're with, and your position on the bill. Hi, my name is Judy Powell. I'm with Parent Guidance Center. We help parents involved in the child welfare system. If you could and, either speak up or pull oh, that just a little closer. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Yeah. That's good. Uh, and I am in support of this bill. I've been waiting for a bill like this since 2004 when <laughs> I first uh, co-founded Parent Guidance Center. I have worked with parents struggling to get these services, and, and that's the thing. Everyone had to complete this service plan. So the, the thing I, you know, I've testified before about is getting a parent's attorneys, but the second biggest problem that parents have with CPS is completing that service plan. And so over the years, I've seen um, parents struggle with that. And so I kind of coined the phrase reunification not available in all areas because if you're in a rural area, say, or you uh, say you work the night shift or graveyard shift and you're mandated to go to a certain contractor and they don't have a class starting at the right time or like someone mentioned um, the Saturday classes, that sort of thing, um, then you were put down as you know not completing your service and it, and it really wasn't the parent's fault. So over the years, I've seen that. Um, with these services, it might be a service may not exist in your area at all. You could have a service contractor that only provides one class. Uh, there's waiting lists, depending on a lot of um, some of the drug-involved cases. There was a long waiting list, and it's like, oh, it wasn't the parent's fault, but you know they weren't starting for three months from now. Um, other things came up, like the mental health professionals. We've all heard over the years and post-pandemic that we totally have a dearth of, of the need you know, for, for mental health professionals. And that is like the number one thing that is on a service plan is pretty much everyone has to have a psych eval and then they get some sort of individual counseling and then often family counseling. Um, and so if there's not someone in your area, I actually have a new case and I can speak to what you were talking about that even in some areas, if there is a contract provided, um, the, this child was removed last November, and I just got the case a couple of weeks ago, but she was the mom was just now starting her individual therapy. The child is a baby, and we're, you know, three, four months in, and she's just now getting the, the individual service. I can also speak to the fact that the schedules have been a problem, and there is kind of a tale of two cases in my world. So I've worked with clients that in the beginning, you know, they didn't have attorneys. I try to get them, you know, attorneys or whatever. Then you have the, the court mandated, you know, appointed attorneys. Then I've also worked with attorneys that the parents have a lot of money. They can pay for things. They can go and find their own services. And then it is like a negotiation like you talked about. You can't just come like the attorney says, oh, we've got a, you know, parenting class or whatever. It's still worked out with the judge and then they still approve that. So it's not like the parent going to some, you know, like Uncle Bob, like you said, uh, it's still a licensed therapist. All of these services also, they already have like a, a another licensing entity, like drug treatment ha already has its own set. If you're going to give drug treatment, you have to have your own set of licensing, just like with um, therapy. So we are very much me, Parent Guidance Center in, in support of this bill. Okay, thank you very much. Members, any other questions? 
Thank you. All right, very much. Thanks for your testimony. Chair calls Brandon Logan. Uh, one accord for kids for the bill, and then Megan Corser is on deck. You state sure. your name, who you're with, and your position on the bill. Chair Frank, Brandon Logan, one accord for kids, uh, testifying in support of the bill of HB 793. Uh, one accord for kids is a community nonprofit in Midland, Texas. Um, we, among other programs, we serve as a backbone organization for a collective impact initiative that's seeking to improve child welfare outcomes in our local region uh, and also prepare our region for community-based care. Uh, region 9 is, if you don't know where it is, it's out in West Texas. It is Permian Basin, Concho Valley, some of Trans-Pecos, some of the Hill Country. It's 40,000 square miles. If it were state, it would be larger than, than 15 states. So this is, this is actually a huge issue for us, and one of the reasons that we support this bill is we do not have uh, quality providers, really any providers, for parent services. Uh, as part of our efforts to get ready for community-based care, we did a public information request to the department asking for all of their contractors that serve Region 9. We got back a list of 564 contractors uh, that allegedly serve Region 9, only 11 of which are actually in our 40,000 square mile region. Uh, the, the contract type that's most relevant to this bill is evaluation and treatment. That's uh, psychological evaluation. It's biopsychosocial evaluation counseling. Um, of that contract type, there are six providers uh, under contract in our region uh, for evaluation and treatment services. There are only three of those that are actually in our region, and whenever I ask those three who are the other three, they literally don't know who these people are. Uh, it appears that they're not actually providing services in our region. Uh, so for the Permian Basin, Middle and Odessa area, there are two uh, evaluation and treatment contractors in our area. Um, the wait list for parent counseling uh, in Midland is six months. So as soon as you're referred to parent counseling in Midland, you're going to wait six months before your first counseling session. I think that is one of the reasons that in our uh, particular region that we are above average in length of time to reunification. We're a month above the state's average. Um, I want to talk to sort of why I think there's not more people on the list. If I looked at the procurement from HHS through DFPS for this. It's over a 100-page procurement packet. Uh, it's quite a lengthy process to have a contract with DFPS. In addition, there are some pretty significant barriers. Uh, the biggest barrier, I think, to just counselors who want to provide counseling services for parents is that you have to be Medicaid uh, provider, and you also have to be on an MCO network list. People who just want to give counsel to a parent who um, may be the type of counselor that you're talking about may not actually want to hold the contract, go through the procedure, be Medicaid approved, um, but may actually be the best uh, counselor and, frankly, the one that's available. Um, so we really see this as um, advancing our region's ability to get ready for community-based care ad yeah. providers. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Just to clarify, y'all are y'all support the bill or you're for the bill? For the bill. Okay. Um, when you said there are a hundred page procurement, that is to be a counselor? That is to hold I mean, the to like evaluation and treatment contract, which includes counseling. So if I want to be a counselor, it's the same packet as if I want to do a psychological evaluations, if I want to do biopsychosocial. In the package, you check which services you want. What's the last one? Bio? Biopsychosocial. And to address the, the we've talked about parenting, but my understanding is parenting actually isn't a contract type, and the department really doesn't pay for that. That may be something you want to ask a resource witness. Um, parenting is something that they require parents to get in the community and pay for it if they have to. Okay. Uh, members, any other questions? All right, thank you, thank and thank you. you for your work out uh, out in West Texas. Um, Chair Calls, Megan Corser, uh, Family Freedom Project for the bill, and then Andrea Sparks, 
uh, with Buckner's is the last one I show signed up to testify, so she's on deck. If you state your name, who you're with, your position on the bill, please. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. My name is Megan Corser. I'm the Chief Policy Analyst at the Family Freedom Project, and we are in full support of HB 793. I think Representative Noble's layout of the bill really clearly articulated some of the barriers that parents face in accessing and completing service options. And so I just want to uh, keep my comments brief and discuss briefly um, the family preservation aspect of the, the benefits that Representative Noble's bill provides. Um, parents face a lot of barriers um, accessing service options. Two of the biggest ones are lack of availability. Um, statute requires DFPS to administer service plans in virtually every case. The only exceptions are kids who are in care for less than 45 days and kids who are in cases that are subject to the aggravated circumstances statute. So these are virtually every parent has to complete a service plan in order to be reunified with their kids. And having a lack of availability of services really creates a problem for these parents to be able to re be reunified with their kids and for kids to be able to be returned home and get out of foster foster care. A um, com com co couple of comments I want to quickly address. Um, there are a lot of um, a lack of availability uh, in service providers. Um, because every parent has to complete service plans and there are a limited number of providers with which the department contracts, um, we often find ourselves in situations in which there are more services that parents are required to complete than there are services available to those parents. Because of the lack of access, parents often have um, difficulty completing those services um, and consequently difficulty being reunified with their kids. The second problem we often encounter is that services aren't well tailored to the parent's individual circumstances. For example, um, the service provider may be on the other side of town, parent may not have transportation to get there. Um, and so we would just really uh, support any effort that the legislature could provide to expand the, the base of service providers that parents have access to so that parents can provide, uh, gain access to services that are better, better tailored to their individual circumstances um, and ultimately be reunified with their kids so that kids can go home more quickly, get out of foster care. Um, and so from the family preservation aspect, we just really would support this bill. Okay. Thank you very much. Members, any questions? Thank you for your testimony. Uh, chair calls uh, Andrea Sparks, Buckner International. I show nobody else wishing to testify, so if you'd state your name, who you're with, and your position on the bill, please. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, committee members. Thank you, Representative Noble, for this bill. Um, I'm Andrea Sparks, and I'm Director of Governmental Relations at Buckner International and testifying for the bill on behalf of Buckner today. Um, we are have been protecting children, strengthening families for over 145 years in Texas. And today we provide a continuum of care for families, which is what I'm handing out to you right now. Um, we have 10 family hope centers around the state. We have seven family pathways, which are residential programs for single parents pursuing higher education. Um, we have various prevention and early intervention contracts with the Department of Family and Protective Services, transitional living. And we support this bill because we believe in, in all of our experience that families have, when they have some choices in some agency in selecting service providers, they'll be more engaged and ultimately, ultimately more successful. In our experience at Buckner, when we empower families instead of requiring them to do things where we meet them where they are and acknowledge their strengths and work with them on, it, on their goals, they tend to rise to the occasion and they tend to feel more supported, um, more respected and have more dignity in the process. Um, we are about transforming generations, transforming lives and generations, and not just a quick fix. Um, the goals that when we work with these families, and we can provide counseling um, as well. We can provide spiritual guidance, which is something that others have said is, is really important. But also, we can help them meet their goals for their family. So you always get a little bit extra when you sign up for <laughs> services at Buckner. You might get more than you, than you than you asked for. And I just want to give you all one example um, of a young mother that was referred to us actually by the department um, for um, parenting classes. She was struggling to raise four children on her own in a very rural area of Texas. Her youngest child had some <clears throat> serious medical needs and his doctors were concerned that she didn't really understand how, what those were and how to, how to help him get the medical care he needed. CPS ended up removing uh, let's call her Tanya, Tanya's son from her care and placed him in a foster home far away in Dallas. 
But she found Buckner through CPS, who referred her for parenting classes to one of our Family Hope Centers there. She did the parenting classes, but she also signed up for a family coach while she was there. She felt comfortable to do that. She found the emotional support she needed with counseling and to get through the stress of the CPS case and being separated from her son. Buckner gave her the financial support to travel to Dallas to visit her son every week. And um, her coach had previously worked in foster care, so was able to help her understand the process and, and what, what she needed to do to get him back. Um, through this time, she also got a new job, and Buckner supplied her with the, the uh, uniform and shoes she needed for that. And she also took financial literacy classes and learned how to manage her family's budget. Um, she was reunited with her son right before Thanksgiving and then entered our Family Pathways program, where she is now pursuing higher education. So um, that, this is why I think it's so important that we can allow community providers to provide these services, because you're not just going to probably get that service. You're going to get connected to a whole network of other services that providers like Buckner can provide. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, members, any other questions or any questions of the witness? Okay, thank you very much for your testimony and your service to these. Um, uh, at this time, there are no other witnesses signed up to testify. Is there anyone else wishing to testify on, for, or against House Bill 793? Okay, but you would like to switch it and testify? Yes, sir. Okay, come on up. Uh, chair calls Maureen and Ball, uh, Ball Self for the bill. If you'd state your name, who you're with, and your position on the bill. Uh, Maureen Ball Self. I'm an attorney that represents parents in CPS cases, and I am definitely for this bill, um, 793. I thank you so much for following it, Representative Noble. It's greatly needed. Uh, I'd like to address this idea about the service plan that parents get. We get a great service plan, right? You're going to do all these wonderful things and have success. So the first thing they do, the parent calls the number. You know, I'm supposed to get this evaluation. They call the number. No response, no response. They're working. They can't take off, you know, to make these phone calls during the day when they're working. So they have to do it after hours when the place they've been assigned to on the service plan is closed. So the ability for them to choose their own provider is essential. The first step is getting that evaluation. Without the evaluation, they're not under the system to get counseling. And that's where we know all these parents are going to end up is in counseling. But they don't get to the counseling step till they do the evaluation. They can't do the evaluation till they get in to see the evaluator, which delays it by months. Um, it's not just a click away on that 2054. I cannot tell you how many times a provider calls me up because I try to assist my client. We never got the 2054. Well, CPS says they sent it to you. You know, so there's this big communication gap that's going on. If you allow the parents to be proactive and participate in selecting their own providers, then they buy into it. They're going to be more trusting of that provider. They're going to be more honest with that provider, which is critical in them getting the care and the services that they need. So I strongly urge this committee to please vote in favor of this bill. All right. Thank you very much. Members, any questions? Yes, Representative Manuel. Uh, okay. Uh, so if you'll... Um, thank you very much. Uh, at this time, there are no other witnesses signed up to testify. Is there anyone else wishing to testify on, for, or against House Bill 793? Seeing none, the public testimony is closed, and the chair recognizes Representative Noble to close on her bill. And I'll rec recognize Representative Manuel to ask Representative Noble a question. I'm just going to play devil's advocate. So, Please do. If there is a fiscal note right now, and basically everyone that's coming up and everything that we're kind of seeing, wouldn't, even with the fiscal note, wouldn't this also take part of the fiscal note off of what they're currently dealing with at CPS because we'd have people on service for a lot. We'd, we'd have children in care a lot of a, or a shorter time than we're having them currently now. That is a great So that would be more cost-saving. And I actually hadn't aspect. thought of that because... <laughs> Really, the, the thing that we haven't talked about much today are the actual children. Right. And mm -hmm. you're talking about not summer camp. You're talking about them in the roughest spot that they've ever been, most uncertain spot. And uh, can we put a price on on uh, how much it costs per day? Yeah, we can do that. But what? But can we put a price on, on reunification and how valuable that is to them if their parents are, are better parents as a result of the services they've gotten? 
Uh, yeah, but I think you make a very good point that I believe this can be done under um, with current resources. Right. Because yeah. I'm think I'm. This is just again me playing devil's advocate. If we know, like in Midland, it's six months, and that's a shorter period, which is a long time to not have your child. If it's a period of six months and we can shorten it to three months, well, then wouldn't we then have to come back and evaluate, well, since you're not housing this child for six months now, you're housing them only for three months, we're actually saving the state money regardless of what the fiscal note is of this bill. I'm just assuming. I, I think that that's a, a marvelous yeah, point. I, I think that is the, the, the challenge we have trouble with, and it, and it really is hard, but is doing dynamic fiscal notes, which is what you're talking about. You know, they'll, they can count the expenses they can see, but counting cost savings. But I think as, as policy people, I think when we see something like this, if, you know, if it's the will of the body or the will of the committee and we say this is important, whether there's a fiscal note or not, if there's agreement among us, I think we can try to get that taken care of. I think we, I mean, if we're going to community yeah. base and a lot of groups have been saying they're community based, they're not going to say, oh, by the way, all your checks cleared, you're done, never come back. They are all are saying we're still here, which is the most important thing. So it still kind of keeps right. the family and mental health aspect continuously going. And it's still also being allowing us to be fiscally conservative at the same yeah. time. That's just me playing devil's advocate. Yeah. All right, uh, Representative Ramos. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm just, it, it seems to me this is, a, it, 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 there's a slippery slope that I guess unintended consequences. In, in my experience in dealing with uh, some of these families, one of my concerns and one of the things that, that the last witness had mentioned, the lack of communication or the difficulty with a, a, a lay person speaking with the bureaucracy. So. If I find my provider and they're waiting paperwork and in, in the hearings that I've had with like the, the CPS and the other attorneys and the ad items and the service providers, the way it is now, in my experience, it's been, well, the judge knows and CPS knows because the provider's already in, in the system. So uh, many times a parent will say, well, I wasn't able to take those classes. Well, the history, the, the relationship that DPS, I mean, the you know, uh, DFPS has had with this provider. They know the, uh, the services have been offered, but the parent has not been taken advantage of those services. So they know somebody's not being forthcoming with what's really happening, right? And so the experience with that provider is that they have been available or accessible or whatever. And so when the t clock is ticking and mom still hasn't taken those classes and mom's still not going to her therapy classes, but dad's been able to do it. Mom just, because mom's been doing her own thing it's easier to come to like a, an actual mm -hmm. conclusion or a come to a, a determination in that case because the CP, the, the courts have had experience with this service provider, have a relationship so they know that mom is or dad is fudging, right? Like not being forthcoming in terms of not being able to take advantage of those services. My concern is when now you're opening the field up to all of these services providers, it puts the court and it seems to me in protective service, it, in, in, in a little more of a bind because now where mom is saying, I really want this service provider and I don't want to go to anybody else that they're get, making me go to, the clock is ticking. And so mom is saying, well, I haven't been able to go to this therapist because I want this church therapist. They haven't been available. And the court is like, well, hey, your safety plan, the clock is ticking. And then the story is the court denied me my religious clergy therapist or what have you, right? And removed my children or what have you, but in fact, maybe that, that provider hasn't been available or mom hasn't really been pursuing that and there's been miscommunication. So what are the safeguards we have? Because it's a slippery slope, you know, it's kind of more in a controlled environment now, but this opens it up. It's, it's a really good question. And, and honestly, we're not opening this up to just anybody in the universe to do it. We're talking about licensed professionals and people that w are willing and able, willing being the important part, to, to get into this, into this arena and wanting to do it. So I anticipate instead the opposite, that they are more willing to visit with the judge and with CPS and others about the progress of this individual than maybe even our contracted providers that that uh, because they are going into this as someone as someone that maybe only has one client, they're probably going to be more on top of it than if you're if you're serving uh, you know 
uh, bigger than how many states was it, he said. So I think actually we'll have better accountability and better communication. That's what I anticipate as a result. But there's nothing in the bill that specifically says there's a this determination or if you're going to utilize this service, X, Y, Z needs to be done to ensure that either well, that, that or we're going to plan. That doesn't ha actually that's already in the code and that's in this part of the code where we put it and that's why we put it there. That that's actually already spelled out in the code there. And so they would already uh, whoever whoever plugs in to do this work will have to meet all those criteria that okay. that are already in the code in that part. All right. Thank, thank you, you for asking. Thank you. Great. That were great discussion and dialogue. Any other questions before she closes? All right. Representative Noble. Uh, thank you, uh, committee and chairman, for hearing me. And, and um, I look forward to showing you the uh, committee sub. Okay. Thank you very much. If there's no objection, House Bill 793 will be left pending. Is there objection? Chair hears none. House Bill 793 is left pending without objection. Okay. Everyone. Uh, Lacey, you're up. Right. Okay. Uh, the chair lays out House Bill 1085 and recognizes Representative Hull to explain her bill. Thank you, Mr. I know you have some changes, but we don't have the committee sub before us, so you're welcome to talk about those. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for allowing me to lay out HB 1085. Um, HB 1085 is a refile from the 87th session with improvements incorporated from discussions held last session and meetings we have had to work on language with the department. This bill is aimed at addressing the problem known as hidden foster care, where parents involved with child protection agencies are asked to voluntarily place their children out of their own homes during investigations, usually while, usually while being asked to work on certain services again voluntarily. This practice takes place outside the approval or oversight of an objective court and often under threat of their child being removed officially from their homes by court order. These agreements called parent-child safety placements or PCSPs between parents and the department create situations where families are separated without a clear understanding of what services they need to complete, how long their child will be gone, how to get their child back into their home, and what will happen if they decide they want to end the voluntary agreement and reunite with their child. This bill is designed to shorten the time frame of these unlimited agreements to 30 days so that families can be helped more quickly and children can come home sooner. This bill allows for one additional 30-day extension if the department revisits the terms of the agreement and informs the parents of their right to counsel in the event that the department opens a case against them. If that is not possible, or as often occurs, there is a disagreement on what is necessary for that child to safely return home, the case can go to court and start receiving the objective oversight that is necessary if this happens. In addition to placing a time limitation, this bill also ensures that the agreement specifies the terms of communication, not just visitation, with the child and allows for the placement to utilize resources such as daycare and other vetted caregivers without risking adverse action by the department, such as being deemed an incapable or unsafe placement. This bill would also require that certain data related to these placements be included in reports on foster care so that we have an understanding of the true number of children separated from their parents. Like what was mentioned, there is an anticipated committee sub with clarifying language that my office worked with the department on. Um, in particular, it will clarify that respite care reference in the bill to mean friends and family members of the caregiver, not paid respite care, which should address the fiscal note concerns. My goal is to save families the heartache of separation when it is not necessary, make the separation shorter, give court oversight as an accountability mechanism, and let us see through the reporting requirements how often these placements are used. I'm happy to answer any questions and uh, reserve the right to close, please. Members, are there any questions for Representative Hull? All right, we will begin. <clears throat> Public testimony on House Bill 1085. Uh, Julia Hatcher, representing herself, who is registered for the House Bill 1085. And I'm also representing Tafta, too, Vice Chair. Yes. Oh, 
Okay. We have that noted. Um, yeah, my name's Julia Hatcher. Again, I'm an attorney in Galveston, uh, also the president of the Texas Association of Family Defense Attorneys. Um, I'm very, uh, I should say, we're very happy that, that you have a bill addressing communications because that has been an issue, parents not being able to communicate um, because it's not in the plan. Um, so that's very important. Um, we, uh, we are a little concerned that the notification of the rights to the parents are only given after the expiration of the first PCSP. Um, in other words, we would prefer if they were, to, if parents were told up front before they signed the first one that they had the right not to sign it. Because I can't tell you how many parents have called me and said, oh, I didn't have to sign it. I, th I thought I had to sign it. They forced me to sign it because they were going to take my kids if I didn't sign it. So I just signed it. They don't read them, they don't know they're voluntary. Um, they're under a lot of duress when they sign these things. Um, and um, because, as you said, they're being coerced by CPS, sign this or we're going to take your kids. Ms. Hatcher, could yes. you clarify, are you, you, are you for the bill? Yes, I'm sorry, okay. for the bill. All right. I was just pointing out this one little concern. But no problem. But generally, we're for, yes, we support the bill. Um, anyway, um, I'll move on from that. Right now, uh, what we're seeing in courts across the state is that uh, re removals are down, as Chair Frank has said, removals are down because of 567 from last session, which is great. Uh, but what we're finding is that courts are ordering parents to comply with PCSPs after denying TMC. So we'll have an adversary hearing. The courts will deny TMC, because, which is temporary managing conservatorship, because they haven't proven immediate danger or an urgent need for protection. Um, but rather than returning the children home, they're ordering them to comply with their PCSPs. This kind of defeats the purpose. So um, anyway, I didn't know if, I just want to make sure all, that you all were aware of that. And that's why it's very important to track these uh, court ordered services cases that involve the PCSPs. Um, especially to know whether or not the courts are ordering them or the parents are doing it voluntarily. Um, but I, I don't know, that's about all I had. Does anybody have any questions? That's my line. <laughs> Members, anybody, anybody, got, any, anybody got any questions? Don't be stealing my line. I feel I like I'm in court. You have any questions? Yeah. Yeah. Members, any questions? I do. Yeah, Representative Ramos. Thank you. So to be clear, what is the current... I, this is the third, the bill says 30 days, but what is the current practice? So right now there is no timeline. And so um, I've seen them last for months. I mean, and parents are like, how do we get out of these? I mean, we're in, I'm in this PCSP and I haven't seen my kid. I can't talk to my kid. Um, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to get out of it. Um, you know, most of these people don't have any money. I'd say file a writ of habeas corpus. They don't have the money to do that. Mm -hmm. If there's not a court proceeding initiated yet, they don't have a court appointed attorney. Um, and, and, and so it's a problem. And so I understand this bill is putting the time limit on it, which is good. That's a good thing. Um, but yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. And, and just to be clear, it's kind of why it's called the hidden foster care system. And at one point there were, and I don't know if the agency's here, but there were 70 or 80,000 kids in this. Now they're down to about 10,000 kids in the hidden foster care. And it's basically, um, there's really no statutes that are around it. It's a caseworker going and saying, hey, you know, maybe we'll do one, maybe we won't. Well, if you'll place them here, you know, safety placement, but it's all done without court supervision. We had discussed over the last couple of years as whether or not this is something we wanted to just say there, there will be none. You know, thou shalt not have any um, because I really do believe all of this should take place under court supervision. This would put a 30 day time limit on it. And just for f full disclosure, actually have a, a bill that has this component in it and a number of others that actually is going to JJFI. So we will try to coordinate whatever is done with this bill. That's why I came back in quickly when I was like, dang it. I've, um, because we're just trying to weigh those. I just don't like having something done with no check and balance without representation, that kind of stuff. I just think it's not healthy. Uh, the 30 days is, um, and actually just, no, we can't talk about other bills, but but we, we, we have discussed it with a lot of people and whether there's 30 days, you know, 30 days, 30 days, but at some point you gotta 
make a decision. So, <coughs> sorry. Any other questions? All right, thank you. Chair calls uh, Andrew Brown, uh, Texas Public Policy, Policy Foundation for the bill and then Megan Corsier on deck. You state your name, who you're with, and your position on the bill, please. Good afternoon, Andrew Brown, Texas Public Policy Foundation, in support of House Bill 1085. Uh, we want to thank Representative Hull for her efforts on shining a light on the hidden foster care system. And it's called hidden foster care for a very good reason. Um, and that terminology was actually coined by uh, Professor Josh Gupta Kagan, who's a clinical professor of law at Columbia University. And I bring that up because he has an excellent law review article in the Stanford Law Review for a number of years that really sparked this conversation outside of just the small group of researchers and practitioners to recognizing this is not just a Texas issue, it's a national issue. And what House Bill 1085 does that we very much appreciate, one, is it brings data. We have had to speculate for years and years about how big this system actually is because there's no consistent data being reported. The feds don't require it, so the states don't report it. Uh, but more importantly, it puts important guardrails, both in terms of timelines, but also critical due process protections that are currently lacking in the way that the hidden foster care system operates. And I want to spend my time talking about um, those issues. Um, one of the major issues is those critical due process protections. And we know of at least three federal lawsuits, there are likely more, um, that have been filed over the lack of due process protections in this. Um, I mean, they go back to as, as um, late as 1997. This case was a Third Circuit case, Croft v. Westmoreland County Children and Youth Services. Um, and the federal court held that the safety placement agreements were based on a threat, whether explicit or implicit, that a child would be removed into foster care if the family did not comply, and that was inherently coercive, the court found. A more recent case was decided just last year in 2022. That case is called Hogan v. Cherokee County. And in that case, the court found that the practice violated the constitutional rights of a North Carolina family who were separated for 13 months over a safety placement agreement. And this actually went to a jury. They sued in civil court, and the father in the case won $1.5 million, and his daughter won $3.1 million to compensate them from the trauma they suffered as a result of that wrongful separation. And critical to both of these decisions was that the families were presented with a false choice, either comply or have your child taken into the traditional foster care system. A final area of concern that came up in both of those cases was the lack of time limits. And it was central to the decision, particularly in Hogan v. Cherokee County, where the court actually found that the Department of Social Services regularly used safety plan agreements to manage what they were calling stuck cases, cases where they didn't feel like they had enough evidence to get removal at court. And so they would put these families under these agreements and then back burner them. And they wouldn't visit. They wouldn't give them services. They'd just keep them under supervision so that they could focus on others. And that was how that family ended up separated for 13 months um, under one of these agreements. Um, now, that does not mean that these PCSPs are not a valuable tool that can be used. As originally intended, it was designed to be a release valve to avoid removals and to get children home safely and to quickly address issues without having to bring families into court. Now... <coughs> In order for a tool to be valuable, however, it has to be transparent, it has to be subject to meaningful oversight, and in this case, it must be time limited. Otherwise, you are getting into an area where you are in serious danger of encroaching on fundamental constitutional rights. And we believe House Bill 1085 strikes a good balance between providing the department with the necessary tools to prevent removals while ensuring that these tools are subject, subject to constitutionally required guardrails. And that's... I'll conclude there and take any questions. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Members, any questions? All right. Did a, did a good job there. Um, chair calls Megan Corsher Family Freedom Project for the bill. You state your name, who you're with, and your position on the bill. I show nobody else wishing to testify on this bill, so if you are wanting to testify, please get registered. Go ahead, Ms. Corsair. 
Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members. My name is Megan Corser. I'm the Chief Policy Analyst at the Family Freedom Project, and we are in support of HB 1085. There are a couple of different ways that Texas statute provides for removal of a child. The first is a formal removal under Chapter 262, and the second is an informal removal under parental child safety placement. There are a lot of due process protections in current statute for formal removals under Chapter 262. For example, parents have to be provided with attorneys if they're indigent. Courts have to make specific findings of abuse or neglect in order to be able to remove uh, a child. There are deadlines uh, for the time period in which a child can be removed before the case goes to termination trial. There are a lot of due process protections in place for formal removal. Unfortunately, there are very few due process protections for parental child safety placements. And the bill really creates some very needed due process protections to correct the, the severe imbalance in due process protections between the two different removal mechanisms under the current statute. We know that parents are often pressured into signing parental child safety placements by CPS as an alternative to formal removal. And parental child safety placements do have benefits and there are places for them. Um, there are a lot of cases in which maybe formal removal doesn't make sense. We don't need to put the kid in formal foster care for up to a year. Maybe a very temporary placement with a relative makes sense during the investigation phase. There are good uses for parental child safety placements, but there are a lot of lack of due process protections. And so the bill um, kind of corrects a lot of that. And there are a lot of reasons that a parent might, uh, you know, agree to a parental child safety placements. A couple of the major ones um, are under the guise of if you don't sign this parental child safety placement and voluntarily remove your child, then we're going to come in and formally remove your child and the court's going to be involved. And that creates a couple of disadvantages, at least with parental child safety placements. Parents often have a say in where their child is placed. And so the department will offer the parent the opportunity to sign the PCSP in exchange for a say in where their kid goes. So the parent can ensure that child stays with a relative or a family friend or someone with, with, with whom the, the parent would trust their child instead of being in foster care with strangers. And then additionally, they don't have the, the complicated core oversight um, issues where there are safety plans required um, and a lot of other, you know, just complications that maybe aren't necessary in that particular case. And so there are good reasons that a parent might ch might um, agree to a parental child safety placement, but the lack of due process protections is a real problem. And what we really see as the primary benefit of this bill is, is due process for parents. Firstly, it would create time limits on uh, parental child safety placements. These si placements couldn't continue indefinitely. It would be limited to 30 days with a 30-day extension. That's a real, real benefit um, over the status quo. And the second benefit is that parents would be notified that they have a right to consult with an attorney before they, they sign these parental child safety placements to eliminate some of the pressure and coercion that we often see in the current system. <coughs> with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. All right. Thank you. Members, any questions? All right. Thank you very much. Uh, there's nobody else wishing to testify, but I do want the resource witness uh, to come up. Uh, Mar Marta Talbert, is that right? <clears throat> DFPS uh, on the bill. If you'd state your name, who you're with, and your position on the bill. Hi. Yes, I'm Marta Talbert. I'm the Acting Associate Commissioner for Child Protective Investigations on the bill. All right. Thank you very much. The ch I wanted to talk, as we have been all day today, I guess, on the... Uh, uh, fiscal note, because <clears throat> it seems like to me this will greatly reduce the number of kids and or has the potential to reduce the kids in the hidden foster care system, but yet there's a negative fiscal note. Could you walk through the implementation and what the costs are? Yes, and let me start <clears throat> by saying this. That fiscal note has will completely change from the work that we've been doing on this bill. So okay. the only part of the fiscal note that is still in question or that we're looking at is the IT part of having to build in. We have data on parental child safety placements and we have data on court ordered services, but to put them together to be able to disperse and they be accurate and good information, that is where <coughs> the cost is at this point is only the IT side. Okay, and am, am I correct in from a fiscal note standpoint, when y'all are providing a fiscal note, let's say I magically had a bill that says you are literally going to have half of this, something will decrease the cost. You can't take that into consideration or you can when you're doing a fiscal note? I mean, I don't know what that would be, but I mean, literally, if we said... Uh, yeah, I'm trying yeah. to think of an example because I want to say yes. I mean, we have done some that maybe... Well, in this it case, would be okay. higher in this way, but this. Okay, way. so so in this case, if if we were to say that this is going to reduce the number of kids in the hidden foster care because we put timelines on it, I'm not saying it is, but it 
likely, if you actually have timelines that you're following, that's going to reduce the number of kids, which should reduce costs somewhere, that there should be a dynamic. It, but I, I really, I think I've been under the impression that you can't do that. Maybe you don't either want to or feel as comfortable. It's easier to see expenses than it is cost savings. Yes, and if you even look at this one, you can see how we um, we ended up. I don't know if it's the actual one that was filed. Let me see the one that was filed to see if we did it. Because, like, we kind of went unknown with it, part of it. Right. Um, like, unable to determine because of that reason, of that we feel like there's a possibility it might need some funding, but there's that possibility as well it would decrease other things, other agency that would kind of offset that price. So, I, yes, we can do that. I think what... I heard earlier that I would caution that I don't know that we can do is when we look at a fiscal note, I think we have to look at what it is for this actual bill and not necessarily go, but it might be different in FBSS or CV, right? Oh, I to no, I but totally agree. I, look, I think you have to be, I always want them to be <laughs> dynamic if it's in my favor when we're doing these, but I think there are some things, yeah, you can't take uh, three yeah. or four steps removed, but if... Yeah. In this case, I think you're probably more talking one step removed. If you have timelines, you know the number of kids in FBSS. It shouldn't be that hard to figure out. If you've got a hard timeline, it's pretty easy to know what's the decrease. Now, we, may, we may say, well, that's terrible. We don't want to decrease it that much. But I do think from an agency standpoint, that's something that, and honestly, I'm going to ask you to provide this, which is if this were to go into effect, what would the change be? You know, how many kids, if you literally have a hard 30-day stop, mm. that's got to be a pretty easy number to, I mean, if we can't tell us that, this really is hidden. <laughs> and I don't have that, but I can get that I, I, I know you I don't, do, but I'm just saying. Yes. But that is something I think I would like you to provide. Like uh, how every, many every, children would that be? I, right. I mean, ha, that, I mean, how, yes, Representative Emanuel. And I, if you don't have that, I understand. What is the cost currently per day? month if you would say if a child is let's just say for 30 days we're going off of this how much would it cost for a child to be there for 30 days <clears throat> and, and i know it would change I don't based have that upon cost. and i think if you're talking about a parental child safety placement yes that's not necessarily i mean yeah, there's that, very there's very limited cost costs there's, yeah. there's no there's almost no reimbursement and this is right. where the fiscal notes get difficult but because the great reduction in, and I'm not talking in removals right. here, I'm talking in the family base, uh, in, the, in the safety placements, mm -hmm. there are caseworkers there. Their caseloads now are down to five right. to one. Right. At some point, there's I, some saying. I thought at some point, like if the child had like special needs or something, the state still is required to make sure that those needs are being met, or is that still not on? It's. I think it's a little different for a parental child safety placement mm -hmm. because okay. that is a non-paid placement. So yeah, that okay, is perfect. a relative that we don't have. We do not have TMC. Um, they can't ask there for is a quarter services. Like that. Right. Yeah. Could this I, is. It really that's what is. I wanted to make sure. Yeah. It really is completely outside. If you notice, when the prior person was talking about it, it's like, well, uh, removals is under this section, and then safety placements. She didn't quote a section because it's not in statute. Okay. It's, but it does it's, not. It's mean, in policy. It's right. in. It's in rules yes but it doesn't mean that we would not the resources that we have currently so if it's um counseling or i don't know maybe that child needs to have some kind of service that we would offer that through our typically typical like 2054s our services that we already have so we would offer that caregiver and child services even though we do not have tmc of that youth okay. child so there, if there is a cost, if there is a cost, it's very minute. It's basically yes. right. Out, outside of personnel cost. Right. Exactly. Yes. yes. That's what I, I just wanted to see no, Ron about what that was. Thank great. you. I want to know how I can get that magic um, line that says um, can be handled among ex with existing resources. <laughs> you want that? <laughs> that's the one. That's the one I want. Yeah, really. That's the magic one. If you if you get something they want, they, it's, that's can be handled within existing resources. That line. <laughs> Members, any other questions? Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. And for smiling, you know. Uh, all right. This time, there are no other witnesses signed up to testify. Is there anyone else wishing to testify on, for, or against House Bill 1085? 
Seeing none, public testimony is closed, and the chair recognizes Representative Hall to close on HB 1085. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for allowing me to lay out this bill, and I um, am excited to get you the anticipated <laughs> sub language. Yeah. Um, so uh, I believe this legislation will help families, and I ask for your favorable consideration, and I close. All right. If there's no objection, House Bill 1085 will be left pending. Is there any objection? Uh, the chair hears none. House Bill 1085 is left pending without objection. Oops. I think we are down to our last. Uh, the chair lays out House Bill 833 and recognizes Representative Campos, Campos to explain her bill. Sorry. Good afternoon, Chairman Frank, Vice Chair Rose, and members. Um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to lay out House Bill 833 related to annual evaluations of our 211 Texas Information Line. HB 833 passed the House last session but ran out of time in the Senate. This bill is a nonpartisan an initiative to more effectively connect Texans to existing services and to ensure that government can provide disaster assistance more effectively in the future. 211 is a vital resource to all Texans. It is the state's front door to a variety of vital services that include referrals to state agencies, regional health services, and local nonprofits. In times of crisis, people rely on 211 Texas. During COVID, we received 3.7 million calls and 3.2 million requests. Whether it be Hurricane Harvey assistance, rental relief, or COVID testing vaccine information, 211 was our state's go to hotline. HB 833 seeks annual evaluations of our 211 system. The U United Way has reported that our system is behind other states in terms of efficiency, innovation, and system integration. Annual evaluations will also allow us to continuously address system limitations, improve customer satisfaction, more effectively deliver community resources, and determine the necessary funds to keep up the increased call volume. I am open for questions, and I reserve the right to close. You will have that. Members, any questions? Representative Campos? All right. Do have uh, one witness, Judy Powell, uh, Chair calls Judy Powell, Parent Guidance Center for the bill. I show nobody else wishing to testify on the bill. And my name is Judy Powell. I'm with Parent Guidance Center, and I'm in support of this bill. I do have the 211 website li or their website listed on my website, and I do uh, understand that a lot of uh, people across, you know, parents and others. Um, do turn to the 211 system in other times, not just disaster. Um, we heard a lot about services today, and that's one place that parents do go and try to look for services. Um, I, f I don't remember when I did put this on my website, but I don't think that it's ever been evaluated. I, I can't recall it ever being um, evaluated. So a problem that we've run into with um, some of our parent clients over the years is a lot of times a service is listed somewhere, but they actually, it's out of date. It, they don't really have that service anymore. And so I feel like when you have evaluations, you have updated information. There's actually the current information for classes or whatever you're looking for. A big part of um, CPS, and we heard that earlier, is service plans. Well, one thing that's always on a service plan, no matter what happens with your child, is safe and stable housing and a stable employment. That's going to go pretty much on every service plan. And so people will turn to that 211 system because that's something that CPS doesn't contract to get you a job or whatever. And so it's very helpful. I think in evaluating uh, some of these programs, systems like this need a little bit updating. You said there was a lot of calls, but is, was that just because of the pandemic? I mean, an evaluation would say, OK, are more people really not calling? Are they really using other? means to you know get this information um there's just across the news now all the chat bot stuff there's just all kinds of integration of technology i think that could be used you know with people's phones and that sort of thing and for me with parent guidance center i look at this as like a child abuse prevention type bill because there's a lot of people they're 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 struggling cps isn't involved yet but 
if they don't get some of the needs met through this system, then maybe there is going to be a CPS call. So I, I feel like it's basically helpful in, in preventing child abuse and, and removal of children. So um, as parent guidance center, I, I do support this bill. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Members, any questions? Okay. I, I am going to call the resource. Uh, Craig, uh, Chair calls Craig Howard with H, uh, HHSC. You'd state your name, who you're with, and your position on the bill. Yes. My name is Craig Howard. I am the director of 211 Texas Information and Referral Network for Health and Human Services Commission. Awesome. Well, thank you. Thank you for being I'm, here. I'm here to answer any questions you might have. All right. Uh, your fiscal note, again, the reason I'm focused on fiscal note one, it makes it, it I mean, it's pretty informative about how it's going to be implemented. But in, in y'all's case, in, in, in this case, it's like it's going to have a big expense, but we don't know what it is. Um, can you tell me how this, what, how you think this is going to impact y'all? What, what you will be required to do under this bill? Well, in, in terms of the bill itself, and, and it's based on the what the evaluation that was was uh, described. Uh, you know, speaking to you know the evaluation recommendations, uh, some enhancements with the technology, uh, obtaining information as it relates to, uh, you know, just obtaining additional data, uh, you know, partnerships, all these different things, which was going to be. Uh, an additional um, work effort. Uh, right now, it's going to involve work effort on the side of uh, the Health and Human Service uh, turn team that is, is exists, and also our, uh, our, our grantees, our stakeholders out there. Um, it's going to involve, you know, or impact uh, them as well in terms of because right now they're they're you know they're they're operating on tight budgets. So the budgeting piece is going to be an effort that's going to involve level of effort. So there's a staffing concern there, plus in terms of the uh, you know staffing concerns and still having to manage the calls that come in and, and the various needs that we support on a typical basis. So to incorporate what I understand is being described as, 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 as in this bill, um, the extra workload and effort that it's going to involve, it okay. isn't going to indeed... Uh, require some but, but it's undisclosed, so I guess I don't know how that works, but I'm assuming that ends up almost with a zero fiscal note since it's undetermined. Well, I think that's the way it ends up passing through, which, but then I guess my question, uh, kind of separate question, looking for an annual review, is, is there a time in the last three to five years that y'all's agency has looked at, hey, what can we do to improve? I mean, kind of where you've done a self-assessment or outside assessment or anything to say, hey, what can we do to do our job better? Well, you know, in, in terms of us evaluating or assessing, um, you know, our environments and, and how we can greater support the Texans out there, I mean, that that's a common practice internally. Uh, in terms of a formal uh, assessment being done, that's going to go back to that. I know it's mentioned here in, in some of the information and back in 2014 when Texas State you know, performed a, a formal evaluation of what what of sorts, but in terms of um, health and human services and 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 actually a formal assessment, I'd have to go back and and. and so when you say it's done sure. internally, when what's the, what what does that look like? Have, what have y'all? That's us being committed and and being completely. Um, and has there been any pro has there been a any type of formal process internally? Well, as as far as the, um, I mean, we we. We assess our, our environment in terms of the call volume, in terms of the needs that, that we capture on a daily basis based on the referral calls that come in right. uh, to our ter a turn center. And from there, there are adjustments made. I mean, I know uh, we, we are looking at uh, or involved in various projects in terms of trying to uh, enhance or, or bring in some additional supports, right, to our environment that's, that's already, you know, it's doing well, but there's, there's some opportunities there. Okay, thank you. Members, any other questions? All right, thank you very much. And I show nobody else wishing to testify. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, at this time, there are no other witnesses signed up to testify. Is there anyone else wishing to testify on, for, or against House Bill 833? Seeing none, public testimony is closed, and the chair recognizes Representative Campos to close on HB 833. 
So again, thank you all for allowing me to present this bill, but I, I think it's so important and there's, we need evaluations with so many agencies and especially with the way that uh, after COVID, I mean, if someone's calling 211, by the time they're called 211, it's because they're in dire straits and they're needing, you know, to get help, whether it's for rent relief. You know, I do a lot of legwork in the streets with homelessness and all types of people, and I've heard all kinds of things about them not needing, not being able to get through for whatever reasons, and we all know how staffing has changed with all industries, but um, again, 211, they offer so much when we talk about services, so I just hope that y'all take all that into consideration and don't forget it past the house. Last question. <laughs> and y'all, some of y'all did support me, so I'm asking for your support again. Okay. So great. thank y'all so much, and I close. Okay, very good. If there's no objection, House Bill 833 will be left pending. Is there objection? The chair hears none. HB 833 is left pending without objection. Members, that does conclude today's agenda. Is there any further business for the committee to address? If not, the chair moves to adjourn. Is there objection? Hearing none, the committee stands adjourned. Subject to call the chair. <laughs>